Uh, it's almost 12 o'clock, so we will not uh, be long. I just want you to know, so don't keep looking at your, at your clocks. Uh, we will uh, uh, just uh, be here for uh, a brief moment, and we'll be out of here. Because what we have witnessed this morning is all about the kingdom of God, and it's about our Redeemer. And so this morning, what I've chosen to speak about uh, within the few moments that we have is just to affirm our faith and our belief in the God that we serve. And so this will be a good time to grab your Bibles, and uh, of course, you can also follow on the screen or on your tablets. We, you know, we live in a broken world. There's no question about it. Far from the ideal Edenic glory that God originally intended for the human race. You know, every day we hear about discouraging situations, bad news, tragic deaths, unsettling developments, and unexpected disasters. In fact, we just heard from our brothers, our brother and sister, and uh, of course Zoe from Nigeria, missionaries there, about you know the tragedies there and the hardship that people are going through. And yet, in the midst of this, they're there taking the good news of Christ to that part of, of the world. You see, we continue to grieve, and in fact, our church family has also experienced suffering and grief uh, in the past few months. We grieve because death is alien to us. We were not created to die until we fell out of favor with God because of sin. And so to date, up to now, humankind continues to seek clarity into the mystery of evil, suffering, and death. Let me share with you a conversation that took place centuries ago between a Jewish rabbi Rabbi Harold Kushner, and his friend Eli Wiesel. So Rabbi Kushner, in conversation, in dialogue with his friend Wiesel, tried to explain the question of suffering. And so Rabbi says to, um, you know, Eli, you know, God is too pained by our sin, by our suffering. And death, but cannot do anything about it because it is a path that Adam and Eve chose. Mr. Weasel, Eli, Rabbi Kushner's friend, looked straight at the rabbi, shook his head, and responded. And listen to this. Well, rabbi, if that is what God is, then he should resign and let someone more competent take over the world. Did you get that? So God should resign so that somebody more competent than God would take over and get the affairs of this world straight. You see... The problem with this conversation, let me submit to all of us this morning, is that it obfuscates and perpetuates some myths about suffering. Let me suggest to you this morning that suffering is not evidence of God's absence, nor about God's inability to do something about it. Rather, Suffering and grief and death and all the things that we have to endure, all of them point to the reality of God's presence with us. Remember in Matthew 1, 23, his name is Emmanuel, God with us. Beautiful song sung to us this morning. He is the God who is with us. And so suffering tests reveals the quality of and deepens our faith in God. You see, when we are suffering, our relationship with God is our greatest refuge. While it is not God's intention for us to come into this world to suffer, 
we must admit that suffering is part of our existence because of our sin and the human inclination to evil. And so the book of Job peers into the gloom, into the darkness of suffering and tries to help us understand a little bit about it. But here's the problem. The book of Job is a conundrum. It raises questions it doesn't address, and it doesn't answer the questions that it raises for us. It is undoubtedly one of the difficult books, leaving the reader bewildered, seeking for more clarity. But you see, a major theme in the book of Job has traditionally been articulated to or as undeserved heartache, suffering, and grief. And I suggest that this is an issue that strikes a chord in the hearts of many people. Yet at the end of this literary masterpiece, God doesn't answer Job's question. And like many of us, we read the Bible and we come away from it confused and bewildered. And so this morning, I just want to share with you a few nuggets from this book as we talk about our lives here on earth the things that we have to go through, and even some of the things that God takes us to do for him as his missionaries, as his people. You see, in the end, the book of Job illustrates for us God's sovereignty, God's absolute power over the world, and this book encourages us to trust completely in God's goodness in God's love, in God's mercy. Throughout this encounter, Job is drawn into an intense relationship with God, so much so that some of us who read this book find it even a little bit more disconcerting and perhaps even a little bit confusing for us. We feel uncomfortable because Job becomes emboldened and he asks God all kinds of questions. And we feel Job Come out. Take it easy. But you see, God calls us. This is, the, this is where Job becomes interesting. God calls us to enter into a dialogue with him, to ask questions. Asking questions is not a sign of your lack of faith or my lack of faith. In fact, rather, it means we are seeking, we are searching, and we want God to hear us and to help us understand. In fact, the book of Job is so interesting that as far back as the 6th century B.C., Ezekiel, the prophet, talks about Job. Three people that Ezekiel mentions, Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, Daniel, Noah, and Job. And he talks about these three people with reference to their righteousness. In fact, as early as the first century A.D., the writer of the book of James also talked about James as one who has what? Patience. And so the book of Job is situated right and center in Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament. So whether you take him as a fiction or a real story, whatever you want to think about it, Job is right there. And so the story begins, he's a righteous man, blameless, upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil. And as unlikely as is imaginable, Every single aspect of his life eventually collapsed into a series of dreadful horrors and calamities. In the end, all is lost. Some of our people here have gone through that, through death, tragedy. And we ask, God, where are you? In fact, his friends could not imagine what was happening to Job. What on earth is going on? This bastion of righteousness, this man who loves God, what's going on? Well, this morning I want you to know, if you've been asking those questions, you're not alone. All of us ask those questions. And it is okay for you as a Christian, as a believer, to ask those questions. But you see, all our theology, all our experience are simply insufficient to understand and explain this insoluble an inexplicable thing about suffering. A righteous man suffers. 
I'm going to conclude with some interesting observations. You see, Job's experience presents a surprising dynamic that occurs in the life of every Christian. Hear me out here. As Christians, we believe so strongly in a loving God that we cannot fathom, we cannot even bring ourselves to understand or believe the depths of the world's suffering. And this can sometimes lead to a loss of faith. In fact, it is often those with deep faith in God, firmly grounded in the love of God who find their faith languishing in the shadows. When faced with the world's suffering, ceaseless pain, the more we believe, the more deeply we experience pain over the suffering of this world, over the suffering of your family member, your church brother or sister, your neighbor, because we love God. What sometimes we call vicarious suffering. We are in there, and that's why we are all called to be members of the body of Christ, to suffer with our brothers and our sisters. And so, in the book of Job, we realize that there is something of a malignant force coming from the person that we call the devil. And the devil causes in our human life suffering. Job presents for the very first time, and I'm going to put it on the screen, something that came to be known as innocent suffering. That an innocent person can also suffer. In fact, we suffer not because we've done anything wrong. An idea that was so strong and steep in Judaism that Jesus had to talk to those disciples in John chapter 9. Lord, who sinned? This man who was born blind, his, his parents, grandparents, and Jesus had to tell them, disabuse their minds. No. So that the work of God might be exemplified in his life. This morning, I want you to know that when we suffer, it is, it is because we are living in a broken world. Not that God could not do anything about it, but you see, God is giving us the freedom of choice. But one day, and this is where Job becomes interesting, Job is telling us that in the midst of all our suffering and all the encounters with the divine Job offers us this cry of hope. I know that my Redeemer lives. And in this statement, I want to distill for us, before I conclude, two main points. I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last day, he will return to or stand on the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, one day, soon and very soon, Jesus will come. And he will right the wrongs of this world. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He is the one who has done it all for us. No wonder this gentleman by name Samuel Medley and his friend John Hatton wrote that beautiful you know, song, the gospel you know, uh, lyrics to this uh, you know, beautiful passage. I know that my redeemer lives. Let me read those words as we bring our time to a close. I know that my redeemer lives. What joy the blessed assurance gives me. He lives. He lives who was once dead. He lives my everlasting head. He reigns above our victorious king of love. All praise we give. Our great redeemer lives. This morning, your redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. Jesus Christ, he is alive. And because he is alive, whatever we are going through in our lives, whatever we have to endure, I want to submit to you this morning that because he lives, we too will live. But more importantly, in the book of Job, we recognize and realize that God is sovereign. God, that's what God does. I don't have to question God. You see, in the end, Job experienced restoration to health, family, prosperity. But that may not be your experience. That may not be my experience. I may end up dying. You may end up losing everything. But I want you to still hold your head high. God 
is there. He understands. Because Job is telling us this morning that our Redeemer lives. This morning, as you think about what Vacation Bible School is all about, the twists and turns in our lives, which is the theme for this week, the twists and turns, we want you to understand that Jesus is still alive. He is our Redeemer. And one day he will stand upon the earth. And one day, even though our bodies may be destroyed, he will bring us back to be with him. If that is your wish, before we sing our last concluding song, maybe you've been looking for a church home. Maybe you want a place where we can all journey together, knowing that our Redeemer lives, and that one day, together, we will see him. Maybe you want us to be together, pray together, study together, share God's word together, and be able to share with others as we sing. If that's your wish, you want to come and join with us, you want a prayer, just step forward, and we will, you know, do that, you know, you know together. Let us stand as we sing our concluding song.